Never have there been so many people in so many parts of the world visiting museums and art galleries. But the experience of most of these people, I suspect, is neither particularly pleasurable nor rewarding. Why should this be? And what can be done to help us engage more deeply with the works of art that we look at? A novel such as Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Marble Fawn suggested that in the mid-19th century, visitors had no problem about spending several hours looking at a limited number of works of art. But the reality today is that most of us have lost this ability, and I believe it's got nothing really to do with uh, having less leisure time. If you go to any museum or gallery, you will see people wandering from one work of art to the next. They'll pause for a few seconds before reading the label and moving on. And in fact, there's probably more reading than looking. And in fact, a lot of people not even looking at all, but taking photographs with their smartphones. Um, various museum... Um, museums' uh, visitor surveys have revealed that we, in fact, spend just seven to ten seconds looking at any individual work of art. This is so dispiriting that we are propelled ever onwards by an awareness of the next exhibit, a sense that there is something else that we have to see, an obligation to gather information, you know, where is the pleasure in all of this? We leave the gallery having looked at hundreds of things, but in fact, seen none of them in any rewarding or memorable way. The problem, partly, is that museums and galleries have become victims of their own success. The experience of a blockbuster exhibition or even the permanent galleries of a major um, institution is miserable. If you have queued, you're exhausted even before you set foot in the gallery. Once inside, you're pushed, you're shoved, you can't look at the work of art you want to see. it. And when finally you have your moment in front of the great masterpiece, um, a sort of bizarre museum etiquette compels people to stand back in a reverential arc, which means that nobody gets to see the work of art properly. A slow art movement has evolved partly in response to all of this. Its roots are in the slow food movement, which began as a, a protest against the opening of a McDonald's in the Piazza di Spagna in Rome in 1986. And this has spawned a whole cultural revolution, or at least a re-evaluation. In 2004, the journalist Carl Honoré published um, In Praise of Slowness, which explored the idea of how a slow philosophy could be applied to all aspects of life. And now there's a slow just about everything. The point is that we should all slow down, savor what we do, and value quality above quantity. And in terms of art, this is specifically about improving the encounter between object and observer, about looking at less but seeing more. To quote Philippe de Montebello, a former director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, most works of art reveal their secrets slowly. Um, this should come as no surprise, given that historically, at least, um, the making of art was a very slow process. And the length of this process sort of influences the time of viewing. Many artists across history have consciously slowed down the visual perception of their work. And they've done this um, through the use of painstaking, even obsessive detail. If you think of the um, 15th century Flemish masters like Jan van Eyck or Hugo van der Herz, um, or by creating a meditative atmosphere 
Mark Rothko, James Turrell, or about something in the formal or technical structure of a work that unfolds over time, you know, a Bill Viola video, say. This kind of art that cultivates patience makes it really easy for us to gaze, to feel, and to dream. Other works of art offer more of a challenge. Great works of art of any kind have the capacity to move us profoundly. We can be transported. They suspend time. They may even change our attitude to life. Yet this only has a chance of happening if we are in the right frame of mind to engage with these works of art on an emotional level. We have to open up a dialogue. We have to drink in a work of art. We have to allow it to give of itself. This takes time and patience. Michael Finlay's 2017 book, Seeing Slowly, Looking at Modern Art, offered a number of guidelines which you can apply to looking at any kind of work of art. His thesis is basically that in order to engage more, we have to first cut out all the noise. That means not read the wall labels, not take an audio guide, and definitely not go on a museum tour. The German collector, Desiree Fuele, has adopted a more radical approach to preparing visitors to contemplate the works of art in his private museum, which opened in a former Nazi telecommunications bunker in Berlin in 2016. Visitors must first relinquish mobile phones and cameras, and then they're ushered into the sound room. Here, you're plunged into pitch darkness. You listen to the tones and equally resonant silences of John Cage's music for piano number two. And these two and a half minutes are sufficient to cleanse the mind and heighten the senses in anticipation of what is to follow. As you emerge out of this darkness, um, the gallery is still pretty dark, in fact, and you encounter Khmer sculpture, Chinese furniture, and contemporary art flooded in pools of light. And this sense of drama heightens expectation. Um, needless to say, there are no panels to be read, only discreetly lurking guides who will answer any questions if summoned. Obviously, this is not a practical solution for a major public, public museum. But I think museums must do more to ensure that we are stopped dead in our tracks, that we approach great masterpieces with a sense of wonder. While deeply sympathetic to the plight of um, underfunded institutions, which depend on herding as many fee-paying visitors as possible through their temporary exhibitions or their galleries, I really believe these institutions also have to take the lead in helping their visitors first to experience and then understand the works of art that they preserve on behalf of us all we need to be reminded or taught how to look. Why can't there be a small space in every museum or gallery where one or two works of art are presented in context and some questions are posed? And this not only invites people to narrow their gaze, but also to use their critical faculties. Why can't there be dimly lit, quiet spaces with a work of art and a chair? Or the opportunity to handle a work of art, or at the very least see it up close without the barriers of either space or glass. In our screen-dominated age, it is so easy to forget that works of art are not 
images. They are objects. Even paintings are three-dimensional. They have a back. In fact, what's on the back, what's under the surface, or the surface th itself can be really revealing. These objects have a physicality. They have a weight. They have a texture, sometimes even a particular smell. And our response to them ought to be visceral. Theirs is a presence and a potency that no image can reproduce or recreate. In an attempt to provide more resonant encounters with works of art, and to introduce people to a wide range of both fine and applied arts, I set up the not-for-profit slow art workshop, SOAR, two years ago. And there have been workshops in public museums, private dealers' galleries, auction houses, and at art fairs. And the idea of these informal free workshops is to harness the goodwill of scholars and experts to allow small groups of people of any age, of any level of knowledge, curious about every kind of work of art, a different kind of experience. And indeed, the emphasis here is on the experiential. These are opportunities to sit around a table and ideally handle an object, or stand around a painting, sculpture, installation, um, and not only look closely and really engage, but to think out loud, to ask questions. The beauty of SOAR, to my mind, is its simplicity. It's a concept. All that it requires is for someone to bring together works of art and expertise. So far, we've had workshops in London, in Oxford, and in Cambridge. But I really hope that this project may flourish anywhere where there is art and passion and inquiring minds. Thank you.